It's nice to see all these youngsters in our group in our midst. Because I remember I was eight years old and I went to the really big meeting in Hong Kong. And I was always nervous because I have a notion and understanding that God is going to be there meeting his people. And I'm one of them. So when I was itchy, you know, sometimes my, my head is like itchy, I would not dare to scratch my head because you know, it's so impolite to try to scratch your own head when God is still staring at you. So uh, it's amazing how spiritual things is like a journey. Salvation is a grand process. It's not like, oh, I become Christian and I was baptized and that's it, you know. And I just go to church once in a while in a tension service and read a little bit of the Bible and that is it. No, salvation is a grand process. So we have to keep on moving forward. We should love Him more each day. We should have a change of a characteristic to be more like Christ, Christ each week. And I believe it or not, I'm really checking on you guys, checking up. I don't want to see the same Kylie, you know, and he's changing. So this Sunday is not like the, old, the last Sunday of Kylie. It's not the last Sunday of Chris, because we are all changing. And we are all loving him more and more. You know how people would know if you love them more? You know, like somebody will tell you they love you, but you, sometimes you don't really feel it, right? You know, they're just saying it, right? But if somebody really loves you, you will tell, you can tell that that love is very intense, you know, and it's getting more and more intense. And some people, that love is so not there, so you don't have any intensity to feel at all. That's why there is always the same. So um, this is a, a very, very important concept in Christianity is to always move forward, always becomes more and more like Christ, more and more loving, more and more fruitful, you know. That's a growing process. So in Hebrew chapter 6, verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to matu maturity, not laying against the foundation of repentance from acts that leads to death and of faith in God, and etc., etc. So all those are good stuff. You know, faith in God, have faith in God, baptism, you know, repentance, sin forgiven, all this are good stuff. We're not saying it's not good stuff, but this kind of elementary teaching is not something that we should always dwell on. We have to move forward. And what happens when you move forward? To make it simple, if you, everybody had to pay, pick up that cross and follow Christ, the cross meaning denying yourself, and as you move forward, you're losing yourself you become more and more like Him. That is the true moving forward. So that's a very, very good, uh, beautiful story. In Mark chapter 14, when they talk about this in Bethany, and this woman with an alabaster jar, and she, she, she broke that jar and poured out all the perfume on Jesus, right? And you know how expensive, expensive perfume uh, the, the more expensive it is, the hole is very small, so you only can give out a little bit, right? And I don't know if any of you use perfume. In the past, you know, in my era of time, people love perfume. Even people giving me, you know, guys perfume, you know. I don't know what to do with it. But nowadays, not too many people are using perfume, huh? You guys do use perfume? Yeah, so does Alice, Alice Jackson, Alabaster jar is really a, a, a container for the perfume, but because it's so expensive, really, really good one. So the, the, the tip is very small. So you have to really like sprinkling on Jesus Christ. 
And this woman is like, no, I don't want to sprinkle on Jesus Christ. I want to pour all over on him. So he broke that jar and poured all on him. And that, that bottle of perfume is very expensive. It was almost like one year of salary. And then, uh, you know, you don't save all your money, right? If you have $3,000 of salary, you do not save $3,000. So in order to save one year's salary, it probably takes you like 20 years. Because every, you know, every $5,000 you make, you'd be lucky if you save 200 bucks right, on your bank. Because you use it up. And especially in those days, this woman may not be so rich. You know, whatever she made, she really had to use it up. So to save an entire salary of worth, well, this is probably all she got. And actually, Jesus later on kind of make a remark saying that is all she, what she have is all she got. She pour on me. It's a good thing. But anyway, this is really expensive stuff. And the people are really, really not feeling good with it because all these religious people with a religious mindset, they say, you know, this, this kind of perfume can, can be sown and, and, and got lots of money to, to help the poor. Right? Isn't that a very noble thing to say? It's like their heart is so with the poor people. So they're, they're looking at something going on ways. and say, no. Save the poor, you know, don't waste it like this. What a waste. And they were arguing with this woman. And Jesus said, leave, them, leave her alone. Because what she did is a good thing. So, you know, in Christianity, a lot of times we have a wrong concept. We're thinking, okay, I'm a Christian now, so I'm going to do good things, right? And I am going to uh, uh, help the poor and do some good deed. Yes, good deed is great. It's great. It's something that we must do. But good deed is not comparable with pouring out your love upon Christ. And what exactly that is? You know, can you believe that you could, like, in a, need, in a time of need, instead of going out your, by your own way to search the way to fix the problem, to solve your own loneliness or your own financial trouble, but you really shut the door up, as Jesus instructed, and go into your inner room and you kneel down and you cry and you whip in front of God and say, Lord, you know, it is hard on me, but I want to do your will. I want to keep on pressing to love you and will pay the price. And I want you to give me the strength to go through this. Now that is called an alabaster jar perfume. That is something that will please us God more than you going outside and do gospel, you know. You think those are not good. Those are, I'm not saying those are not good. But the really intimate love, the ultimate love that you pour upon Christ on her feet, like whipping on his feet, pleases the heart of God more. And I'm telling you, it will bring down the miracle's power upon you. Because we, we learned from a long time, from many sermons, that he's the one that control. He's the one that given and he's the one that takes it away. So if you please us him, you won't be lacking. And if you don't please us him, you will always be lacking. It's impossible for you not to lack. Because he is the source of everything. He is all the goodness of him. As James said, you know, all the goodness is from him. It's from God, the God of light. So, in this story, uh, this woman was, was, was bothered by all these people, and Jesus said, no, leave her alone. Verse 6, leave her alone, said Jesus, why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful things to me. The poor, you, the poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. Do you know, some people think that loving God is just like always loving God, you know. Woke up in the morning loving God, you know. No, actually, loving God really reflects on your action. And that action takes an opportunity, you know. So Chris is sitting right here, sitting down right here. If he really have a heart to love God, but how can he show that he loves God? He cannot show it, right? But there are moments in your life, maybe only a few, a decision comes that you have a choice to make, you know, and then it's a tough choice, but because you love God, you make that choice. 
And it was only in that moment that you can love God. This is what Jesus was saying. There's always poor. There's always good deed. You can always do good deed. But you cannot always have the, point, the opportunity to show your love to me, to show that you genuinely love me and willing to do anything, paying any price, like this woman of breaking everything she got because she wants this outpouring of her love to Christ. And that opportunity doesn't come often. <coughs> I was watching this movie, Deadpool, and there, there was some really, really spiritual saying in it. And at the end, he was, this guy was telling uh, Deadpool, he said, you know, it's only a few moments of time that you can become a hero. People think that being a hero is you wake up in a hero and going to sleep in a hero. No. It's only a few moments in your life that you have a chance to become a hero because you are given a choice to make the right choice, a choice to sacrifice yourself, a, a, a choice to do something you know, in a heroic sense. But you don't always have that chance. You cannot always be a hero. Just sitting right there, you're not a hero, right? So this is really, really important. If you really love God, you have to understand what is more important. Yes, we do good deeds. We do this normal good stuff like the Boy Scout, right? You guys are always doing good deeds, right? But when there's a time, when there's a moment that you can rely on yourself or you can rely on Him, you can give up for God or you can gain for your own selfish reason, that is the time. And this woman did it beautifully. He broke that jaw. And Jesus was saying that he was doing it for my burial. You know, the very, very good perfume would last for days, right? In the past, I, I didn't know when I was a little kid, and I, saw, I thought all perfume are uh, created equal. So I thought, wow, this is like $300 for one little tiny bottle. And it's the same thing, same brand. It's the same perfume, same thing. But this one is like $30 for a huge bottle. So I was thinking, I thought I got a good, great deal. So I bought that, you know, for my wife. And it's like, yeah, see, this is really expensive stuff. I said, but this is not the real, they, they call it a different name. They, they call it, it's, it's, not the same, it's not the same name, actually. It's all perfume. But this one, the cheap one, you put it on, the next day you won't smell it. But the good one, you put it on, it, it lasts for a few days. That's why, that's why it is so darn expensive. It's the same smell, but the smell will not last. So when, they, when this woman, they pour this on Jesus Christ, and as he going on to the cross, remember that night he, they were beating him up, whipping him, and he was carrying that heavy cross up there. Throughout this whole most horrific period of Jesus you know, on the cross trial, he smelled that. That fragrance is with him. And he sensed, he remembered the love of the woman. Isn't that beautiful? It's like a beautiful love story thing, right? And this is what Jesus was saying. Because somehow, I don't know if she knows that he's going to die or not, but she was doing it for his, for his burial. And as he was suffering on that path to Calvary, he constantly enjoying and, you know, with her love, pouring upon him. So it's important. So on verse uh, 8, she did what she could. She poured perfume on my body be beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Wow, what kind of statement is that? Imagine if Christ said that, make that statement. You know, Kevin, you know, what he, Kevin did to me is so great. So whoever go out and preach this gospel to the world, you have always had to tell this story to remember, to remember Calvin. It's like, gee, this is such an honor, right? This is probably the highest honor that Jesus ever spoke to any human, humankind. Even Moses doesn't have that. Solomon or King David, nobody has that. But this woman, you know, this is so lucky to do something that God said, Whoever preaches the gospel, they must mention this, they to remember her. So, but the point of this is the gospel. You know, the gospel, as I said, is like a grand process. Gospel is Christ and all his work, right? So it's not that simple. 
I mean, it's easy to become a Christian and receive the gospel and become Christian. But to really, you know, to live out this life of let the gospel complete in you, or let all the work of Christ complete in you, is really a grand process. So, Paul saying, when you guys preaching the gospel, you have to mention this. Mention this story. Why? Because this story is a story that already, for seeking the elementary teaching, is going to a point where you're talking about loving God to a point that you will do everything. You will pour out yourself. You will break your alabaster jar. Like ultimate love. And that is part of the gospel to be preached. And unfortunately, a lot of church will not like to preach this kind of sermon. Because this is a hard sermon. You know, it's telling people that you'll be blessed, you will not go to hell when you become Christ, uh, Christian, is one thing. Telling people to really break their alabaster jar is another thing. A lot of people think, oh, this kind of word is too tough. I'm going to just find another church. It's easy to preach a happy sermon. And I can even throw you some jokes to make it a happy sermon some kind of cute story, right? But this is some, time, some kind of meat that if you really want to enter into perfection, you have to listen to this. And this is part of the gospel. Believe it or not, it's part of the gospel to pour out everything that you got to love God. Because God doesn't really like partial things. You know, you really have to pour out everything in order for Him to sit in the highest priority. But a lot of us, you know, a lot of Christians are really putting God in a really, really small corner. Right? To really put Him as Lord, to put His things, His kingdom matter in the first priority over anything else is not easy. That really requires a complete brokenness. And why is this broken? Brokenness is so important. Because some people doesn't want people to touch them. Not, not to mention they, will have, they can allow people to break them. Right? Some of the people are so enclosed, don't even touch me. Right? Don't even dig inside me. It's off limit. It's privacy. You know, everything is me. But God wants to break that. To be like the broken alabaster jar is like completely like open. It's not an easy thing to do. But why, why is it necessary? And in John first, chapter 7, it was really a, on verse 37, on the last and greatest day of the festival. This is really, really a big time. And Jesus stood and said in a loud voice. So Jesus is making something very, very serious. This proclamation must be so darn serious that in the most important day, he stood up. He probably even stepped up on some of the rock and make himself higher and yelled in a loud voice. Hey, what he's going to say is not going to be something like, you know, like Crystal, pass me a cup of tea. It's not going to be something like this. It's going to be so darn important. And what it is what he say? Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this, he meant the spirit. Okay? So when we believe Christ, we have this spirit, Holy Spirit inside us, right? But how many of us can really allow or have that Holy Spirit pour out from us, flow out from us like living water, mighty water, not, not a little faucet that you take shower with and sometimes it was stuck, you know, just a little sprinkle of water coming down, a little stream of water coming down. No, it's like mighty water, right? Rivers of spring, like pouring out. And that is the effect that a normal Christian should have. For those who have the Spirit of God. And you see why how today a lot of Christians are not no different than other non-Christians. You know why? Because they are dripping. They're dripping that Holy Spirit out. You know they have a Spirit of God. Some of them are so carnal, don't you don't even sense the Spirit of God. But some of them, you, you do feel the Holy Spirit, but it's just like a dripping, you know, a little faucet that is even stuck. And the water coming out, but it's not really, you know. But Jesus is saying that if the Spirit is in you, not just in you, not just it's going to drip out, but it's going to pour out like rivers, rivers of water. And why would that be? 
That is related with the story that we talked earlier, the Alice Jackson Alabaster Jar broken. You have to be broken in order that the perfume, the spirit within, the anointing within can pour out from you. And if you're wondering why my anointing is not floating, because you still have too much self. Your, your jar is not completely broken. You just keep on, be patient, and let God brick you and brick you and brick you. It won't be comfortable. That's all you're saving. It's everything that you got. You put it on the line, and, and you see it crushing. And you feel like, geez, you know? But then all of a sudden, the anointing will pour out. And then there's like this, what Jesus is saying, that the spirit inside you, the indwelling Holy Spirit inside you is not just like, you know, flickering like fire, but it's going to be like a mighty water that pours out. So it's important. It's important how we have to really move forward to a point where the power, kingdom power within you is going to outpour. It's important to a point that you have to learn how to really submit yourself and, and offer your entire person to God and let Him do what He pleases. And that's called bricking, right? You don't do it your way anymore, it's His way. And we always say that it's my life, right? This is one of these really great statements. My life. Yeah, nobody can tell me what to do. This is my life. Yes, but there's one person that will ultimately tell you what to do. And if you don't listen to him, what will happen? You know what will happen? And this, this is the main cause of this sermon. You really want to listen to this. You want to understand the consequences if you do not break your jaw and let it pour out. Okay? But before I get to that, let me make one point clear so you will totally understand the last story. So this story comes in John 6. And Jesus was, uh, John 6, on, you know, John chapter 6, Jesus was feeding the multitude, 5,000 people, you know, great miracles, everybody was following him, he had a lot of disciples. And then, on, when it comes to verse 53, then there was a lot of people following him. Because if you, if you can see somebody can multiply things unlimited, would you think that is really awesome? That is probably one of the most awesome miracles, right? Imagine somebody can then hold a hundred dollar bill and keep on spreading until it's 15 billions, right? And it's unlimited. You can keep on, this one hundred dollar bill becomes 10 and 10 becomes spirit apart, it becomes, whoa, it's like, it's like tons of money that fills this whole room. And you would say, wow, I am going to follow this guy, right? This is exactly what happened over there. If this, this guy can, 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 can create things from nothing. He has to be God, okay? And we'll never be starved again. So Jesus, at that peak of his ministry with all these people, and Jesus started talking something that is so hard to swallow. And he was saying that, you know that I can, my, my flesh can be eaten. You have to eat my flesh, otherwise you have no life. You should drink my, drink my blood. Okay, if you don't drink my blood, if you drink my blood, I'll be in you and you'll be in me. You know, I'll be, you know, we're coming to this mystical union. And, and he's talking about eating. And then people are saying here, gee, on verse 60, on hearing it, many of his disciples, these are disciples now, these are not people gathering a crowd. This is really the people that has been following Jesus because he can totally perform amazing stuff. That this kind of disciples say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Yeah, I think this is the moment of this church. We're having a lot of good times, and now it's time to move forward, and we're going to talk about something deeper, something that pleases God more. And it's going to be a hard teaching. It's not going to be easy to, for you to listen, you know. It's good to preach on some kind of fun subject, but when we're talking about the cross, denying yourself, breaking the Alice about, uh, Alice J alabaster jar and all this stuff, it's not good. It's, and it's talking about eating. His, 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 you know, we just, we, on our communion, we just did that. But basically, Jesus is not trying to make it gross. Like he did not you know, roll up his sleeve and say, my flesh can't eat, bite me, you know. And he's not like slaving his 
his wrist and have a jar of blood and drink this. Otherwise, no, he's not doing that. You know, he's talking about, I am the fruit of heaven. You know, he's talking about, you guys have to come into. It's not that hard to listen. Why is it so hard to listen? You know that the issue like people, a lot of time when they eat lamb, they just slit it and they just cut the, the meat and they would, you know, eat that raw blood thing. And they would eat the liver raw like that. They're very gross people. So don't tell me eating, a, eating a, 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 the meat and, and drinking his blood of the Messiah is that, that kind of gross, hard to eat. The point is, it is a call, it's a relationship call saying that I want to be one with you. You have to be one with me. I'll be in you and you will be within me if you protect this body of me. Of me. It's like become one. And they say, oh no, because you know why? For some reason, they are very smart. They understand this principle. If anybody want to be one with God, they will have to lose themselves. They will have to break the alabaster bar. It's the same meaning. When we talk about mystical union, it's supposed to be a beautiful thing. Actually, basically, the whole entire Bible is calling for this mystical union. But it's a very, very hard sermon to listen to and people are shying away from it. It's like, I don't want to get that close to God. I don't want to come into intimacy with God. Also, I'm, the church is being called his bride. You know? But we don't act like a bride. God, man, good. Right? Husband, wife, mm, not good. Bridegroom, bride, no. Intimate love, no, I, I'm not into that kind of stuff. I don't like this kind of bushy stuff. I really want to stay and just be a good Christian. I'm doing some good deeds. And when you talk about mystical union, it's almost like Jesus telling them, eat my flesh and drink my blood. You say, whoa, this kind of stuff is really, really hard to swallow. I'm not going to get into this. I'm going to find myself a new church. And if you find another church, if that church is also a church that strives to perfection, they will leave the elementary teaching. They will also eventually will come to that point where you will have to eat his blood, uh, drink his blood, and eat his flesh. You cannot shy away from it. It's just the Bible. You know, this is the whole thing about gospel. You don't just come in here and become Christian and get on your lifelong cruise ship and sunbathing till kingdom. You're going to pay your price. You're going to walk through that narrow gate and you're going to listen to some good, happy sermon and you're going to take some really, really hard to hard to hear sermon, and this is one of them. And at first, there was a lot of youngsters sitting around and saying, gee, perfect timing, Lord. I was struggling about today's sermon. I was saying, Lord, if, if you're really going to give them this hard sermon, you got to give us some incentive. And that's why, you know, this today, today's worship is special. Today's, today's worship, you know, for those who are late, did not hear it, it's like God said, okay, I am going to grant them a wish as a miracle in their life. So that's why many were saying, whatever your heart really needs it, I don't want you to tell him all your dreams, but if you have some kind of things that you really need, whether it's, it's to find a boyfriend or find a better job or to take care of some kind of sickness or whatever, you know, you just offer up to God and God will fulfill it as a miracle, as a blessing, as a gift for the worship. So did any of you get anything? I was having a whole long list too. But, uh, but I'm smart enough to how to summarize all those long lists. It becomes one. And I got mine. It's a big miracle day. It's a day where, the, where God is passing out miracles. And it's not, this kind of day doesn't come easy. So, but why is all this good stuff? Because of this hard sermon that I'm preaching right now. You have to really listen to it. So people are really uh, uh, leaving Jesus. And uh, in verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Isn't that sad? So I hope this is not one of the sermons that you will listen and say, and it's like, oh, okay, okay. Uh, I think I will leave this church. I don't want to continue this church because I don't want to listen to this kind of stuff. This is too tough. This is too hard to say. 
And you'll be, you know, like this scripture saying that one of the disciples, that you're going to leave this church. You're going to turn away from God and turn back and no longer follow Him. And you know, remember this verse. This verse is very easy to remember. It's John chapter 6, verse 66. The 666 doesn't ring a bell to you. The moment that you feel this is too tough or something is requiring you too much in loving God, you're going to fall down into John 666. So, yep, I'm pretty sure you guys will remember for the rest of your life. So now this is the real story now. I only have like about seven minutes, so listen carefully. This is happening in uh, 2 Samuel. Oh uh, yeah, 2 Samuel uh, verse 20, uh, uh, chapter 24. It's basically talking about uh, God excite King David so he will want to keep, take account, you know, to count up his, uh, his army. And then even his, his, his servant, you know, the general, uh, J, 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 uh, jo, Joab. Joab was saying that you don't have to count it. Whatever number it is, you know, God is going to multiply by 100 times. So, so why, why are you going to do such thing? But of course, King David insists. So King David insists, and then he's called, he, he, the, 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 the army, they went to count, take count. And they comes back in 9 months and 20 days. That takes that long to count. How many people? Because the number that they count out, Israel has 800,000 soldiers. And Judah has, right? Yeah, Judah has 500,000 soldiers. That is a lot of, a lot of soldiers. It's 1.3 million soldiers. I don't know how many soldiers did the United States has. You think it hits... It should, it should probably hit a million, huh? Not even a million. I mean, 1.3 million soldiers is a lot. Especially in those days. I don't think even the Roman Empire has that, that many armies. This is really a serious number of army, right? So, of course, uh, David was really like, like want to see how strong my army is. And he has this kind of self-pride in it a little bit. And also say, yeah, I get all this or this army, you know. But you know, this is, of course, it's a trick, right? God excites him to do this so that God can punish him. <laughs> Isn't that a mean God? You know how uh, this is, I mean, it says it in the first verse one, God excites David to do this. Basically, he, he, he's planning all this out, so he's tricking his son into doing something bad so he can spank him. And then in... Uh, you know, the funny thing is in First uh, Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, is that Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So, in First Chronicles 21, it was saying that it's Satan that comes out and stimulates David to do it, to come, to take come. But in, in 2 Samuel, we're talking about God is the one that is exciting David to keep count. So I don't know who is, who is really doing it, but I know one thing, David is doomed. God is trying to stimulate him to make a mistake. And Satan rose up and tried to stimulate him. Of course, we know God is in ultimate uh, you know, control. This is another sermon to really clear out who did what. Okay? And, uh, but anyway, poor David... And before he makes this mistake, God is really, really tricky. He always gives him your chance. It's like he's telling uh, uh, jo Joab, he's telling, why? Why, king? Don't, don't do this. It's no use. So it's like, don't tell me that I did not warn you. That is a warning. But of course, King David said, oh, what's wrong? I just want to count, you know? But then, actually, David is also very smart because after they finish the counting in nine months and 20 days and the number comes in, comes in, in verse 10, David was... Conscious, stricken after he had counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. So David is very smart. He knows when he makes a mistake. 
right? And then my wife was coming up with a smarter answer. She was saying that, why ask God to take away your, to remove your guilt when you can ask Him to forgive, forgive your sin? You know, it's a wrong word of praying. And that word costs Him a lot. You know, when you pray for, like, peanuts pray, it doesn't matter what kind of word you use. You can say anything you want. But when you come into serious prayer, that's why yesterday we were talking about a seal chat, about some of the prayer, you really want to get every word proper. Because if I'm pretty sure if David was, understand, oh, I, I made a mistake, and he really bowed down before God and begged for forgiveness, forgiven of my sin, and do not, do not hurt the people, do not hurt, you know, and God will have mercy. But oh, David was kind of foolish here. He did not make the right call, right, using the right word of his repentance because he is making a mistake earlier. You know, when you're making a mistake, it will just get you dumber. And the dumber will just get dumber and dumber. <laughs> Seriously, the more you do the right thing, the smarter you get. And even when you pray, you pray smarter. But when you make a mistake, you just get dumber and dumber. It's just another principle, and it will take another sermon to talk about this. But today, that's not the point. The point is, so he did not ask for forgiveness of sin. He doesn't know how to come into full repentance. So he just said, oh Lord, remove that guilt. I have feeling guilt. Who cares about your feeling guilt? Okay? <laughs> and then the Lord is really, really humorous. He did not punish him right away. You know, just the next day, God told, uh, get, get one of these, uh, gag the, uh, the prophet, and tell Gad to tell David. So it's like a one day period of time, and Gad telling David, okay, now the Lord wants to hurt you. He's punishing you. He's giving you free choices. You want to have a seven years of famine in your country? Or you just want to have three days where the enemy is chasing after you? Pursuing after you? Huh? Three months. Oh, three months, sorry. Or the last one is three days of plague. Now, it's your choice. It's almost like a father, you know, trying to punish the kids. Okay, I'm going to spank you. You want me to spank you with this big stick? Or you want me to hit you with this baseball bat with nails on it? <laughs> or you want me to use this knife to slowly poke your ears or something? Right. Yeah, my mom always gave me this kind of choice. But not in that extreme, right? My mom would say, you want me to spank you with this ruler? Or you want me to pinch your ears? She, she likes to do this kind of pinching ear. She thinks it doesn't hurt that much. Actually, it hurts a lot. I mean, but she was like, <laughs> so, uh, and she, oh, you want to, uh, you know, she give me a choice of punishment. And me and, me and my sister always choose this kind of uh, picking of ear. But then, actually, that's the worst kind. Every time we finish it, shucks, next time don't do that. You know? Because no matter, it really, really hurts like hell. And sometimes, if you really make a big mistake, she will use two hands with two of these things. Okay, anyway, but David was pretty smart. He's calculating, okay, seven years, I don't know what will happen. Okay, three months is a long time. Let's just take the shortest path. Three days. I'm taking you, in Chinese, it's very good, right? It's like you want to suffer for a long time, might as well just, just give it to me, just smack it, okay? And David was saying, okay, just give it to me. And of course, he was making this really, really wonderful speech. He's really not a dumb guy. He's really smart. He knows how to pray. He knows how to manipulate the heart of God. He, he's the guy that, that's totally like, know how to please God. So he's saying, oh, I'd rather not fall into the hands of my enemies. I'd rather fall into the hands of God because He is merciful. He is kind. He will never be, be angry for long. He's like, like praising Him of His mercy. Then the guy says, okay. Then we send him the angel and the angels, boom! It's my 70,000 people with the plate. That is a lot of people. I was wondering, uh, how much people you can sit in a football coliseum? Depends where. Huh? Depends where. The college ones can fit 110,000. 110,000. It's almost like 70,000, 700. Oh, 70,000 is a lot of people. It's almost like a full stadium of people smite out, right? And until, until Jerusalem, the angel is going into Jerusalem, 
and God is looking at Jerusalem and saying, Halt! Stop! Okay? That's enough. Why? Because Jerusalem is the, pip, is the apple of his eyes. See, that's why it's good to be in a certain place. You know when God smite even his own people? If you're in the wrong place, you'll be just like, like, like wildfire kind of cut away. But if you, in his heart, Jerusalem representing you know, the, the heart of him, and when the, when the angel is going there, no, stop, that's good. That's good enough. <laughs> it's like, like I'm beating up all my kids, right? And when it comes to the ultimate loving kid, is it, okay, okay, I'm tired. <laughs> that's exactly what God is doing. And uh, this whole point I was saying, tell us, why are you telling me this, this, this story? What does that have anything to do with the alabaster jar? jar? It has exactly what is related with the Alice Jackson Bar. Alice, <laughs> alabaster jar. Because the point right here is sometimes we get carried away. God bless us so greatly. We feel like oh, those things belong to us. No, it's not belong to you. You think you own your house? Yes, God let you own your house. Actually, basically, it's still His. He just let you live in it and let you own it in your lifetime. Okay? If you have a lot of money in your account, don't say, oh, I'm rich. No, actually, you're not rich. God just, we are steward of Christ. He just gives you a lot of money to put in your bank account so it looks good and you can use it, you can enjoy it, but actually, it's His money. You are using it for Him. Nothing in life really belongs to you. King David had this wrong concept. Oh, I have lots of army. So let me count. Let me keep count. Count what? It's not even your money. It's like somebody want to go into somebody's purse and try to count how much money they got. <laughs> and the lady will say, why? Why are you counting my money? And then David will say, oh, I thought it's my money. <laughs> and David got a big slap from God. And that is 70,000 men. Wipe out. So we have to learn this lesson. There's a lot of stuff that we have in life you think is yours. Your spouse, your kids, you know, whatever money is really not yours. Abraham, for once, he thought his Isaac is his. It's a blessed. It's the blessing, you know, from all the prophets and, and God himself. But no, God said, why don't you offer Isaac to me? And Abraham, all of a sudden, understand, whoa, maybe Isaac is not mine. Actually, Isaac is not him. It's not his. It's his, but it's not his. It's really of God. Everything you got, including your loved one, is of God. And he can take it away. If he wants to take it away, you cannot stop him. And you have to learn how to answer and pray like Job. Oh, yeah, God given and God takes it away. Bless his name. You know, you really have to do that because nothing in this earth is really yours. Why is it such an important concept to grasp? Because we are very, very selfish people. We are very self-focused. Everything that we own, if you give it to me long enough, I thought it's mine. You know, sad to say, that's how our character is. If I, let, if I lend somebody a, 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 a camera for 40 years, that person would totally forget that it's your camera. It becomes like his camera. Try to lend somebody a book for 30 years. He would not even, he would totally forget it. It becomes his book. And so David learned a very hard lesson. And why this lesson is important? Because if you do not see this, you will not have the courage to break your alabaster jar. I'm telling you, some of you, so I really wish to have a husband or a wife, or boyfriend or girlfriend. And this is the situation you really have to see who can give you and who can take it away. And if you can see that, then your ultimate Resolving method is not about chasing, it's about pleasing the one that can give you and grant you. And if you want to keep a marriage, if you want to keep a good relationship, there is somebody that you ultimately must please because he is the one that also can take it away because whatever you have, even if it's your wife, it is not yours. 
I was really like counting my blessing. It's like overwhelming blessing. Especially the year of 2016, I'm like absolutely no lacking. And I'm telling my wife, oh, this is so darn great. But I also tell my wife, you know, if God one day wants to take it all away, I want to be ready. And she said, yes, we will be ready. Because we, we are not dumb enough to think that it's all ours. It's what he gave to us. And I was telling God, Lord, I give all, you give me so much blessing. I'm so thankful. And then the Lord said, yeah, if one day if I ask you to give it all up for me, will you do it? And then, of course, Charles is pretty smart. So I've been trained for many years. I said, Lord, yes, of course. It's all yours, not mine. Right? You can take it anytime you want. You can do anything you please. But I know because of your character, you will not take anything from me. Plus, you will add on more and more infinite, infinite blessing upon me. And the Lord said, yes, you know me well. <laughs> Seriously, when, when Abraham is trying, really trying to offer up Isaac, God doesn't want you, Isaac. Why God need you to suffer? Why God need to take anything from you? He made this whole universe. He, he's the one that gives. He's the, he's the source of all things. But he's testing you. And you will not be able to break that jar of yours if you do not see this point. If you do not learn this, this uh, Second Samuel story, you will always hold on tight to what you have. And you will always try your best to search, to seek what you want to have. And ignoring the fact, the ultimate thing that you have to, to understand is he is God. He's the one that given, and he's the one that takes it away. And he's the only one thing, if you can only do one thing in your life to live a blessed life, is to please him. If you, if you don't please him, I don't know, I don't know what to say. It may take nine months and 20 days, but he will come around to you. And you may fall into John 666. Who knows? So I want you guys to be blessed. This is a tough sermon. But it's your choice. When the opportunity comes to do the right thing, it's always his will to do the right thing. And it's the right thing that pleases him. And no matter what the cause is, do it. Because if you don't do it, you end up losing more. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know we are going deeper in this journey. We're learning more about you. And you're blessing us more and you're rising up, rising us up. You're giving us more and you also expect more. Lord, we want to have this mindset to prepare that in this journey of mine, I will pour out myself, I will pour out my life, I will pour out anything for your kingdom to please you. I will wait for that moment of opportunity to give up, to sacrifice, to make that call to please you. Because you are the most important person in our life. Bless us all and protect us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.